Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, new coronavirus cases in Canada, and some of them appear to have been infected here. It is these community cases that give us um, some degree of concern and grief. And Ottawa prepares to take action. Do everything we can to keep ensuring that Canadians are kept safe. And Italy overwhelmed with coronavirus. This situation is like a bomb that explodes. Hospitals so swamped with patients, doctors are forced to choose who to treat. I voted for Joe Biden. For Biden. A key race in Michigan. Can Joe Biden expand his lead? I'm not pretty, but I'm smart and I'm bold. She's about to be inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Now Jan Arden is really opening up about her family's struggles. My brother was arrested for a first-degree murder in the same month that I was signed to a record deal. And why this award means more than any other. This is The National. The pace of the coronavirus outbreak in Canada is accelerating. There are more infections in three provinces. One new one in Ontario. In Alberta, cases doubled to 14. And in B.C., seven new cases. Two are especially concerning. They appear to have been spread locally. So in a moment, we'll examine Ottawa's planned response to the virus. We'll take you to Italy, where hospitals are struggling to keep up with the outbreak. And we'll look at some of the drastic measures in places like New York, where authorities are cancelling school and calling in the National Guard. But we begin with the concern in British Columbia. Tina Lovegreen starts our coverage. At the care home where Canada's first COVID-19 death was recorded, two more cases, both health care workers. They're both in isolation at home. Um, there's been a number of testing being done on people with symptoms. Health officials are still investigating how the virus made it into the care home and now two more cases of apparent community spread are under the microscope. Well, these people are in isolation. We know they're close contacts. We can stop those chains of transmission so they don't continue in our communities. There are more cases in BC, now a total of 39. Uh, some positive news, but of course some really challenging news uh, for the families involved. Some have recovered, including an 80-year-old woman who is being cared for at the hospital. But just across the border in Washington state, more than 70 new cases in just one day. So the number of people who are infected in an epidemic like this will double in the state of Washington unless we take some, some real action here. The virus has been detected at 10 different long-term care homes, causing two more deaths. New rules at Washington care homes have been put in place. Each patient is limited to one person or visit per day and every visitor will be screened for the virus. Talk about seniors who are living in care home setting, they are more vulnerable. There are worries the same kind of spread will happen here. I'm concerned because that uh, we know that care homes is the home for many seniors, in particular those who are more frail, and um, you know, a, that number at this point uh, may even change further, so it is a concern. But with BC doing more testing, officials are hopeful they'll stop the spread before things get out of hand. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, with the outbreak evolving in both Canada and abroad, and with the economic impact spreading, Ottawa has faced increasing calls for action. David Cochran has the latest on their plans. Uh, we recognize that there are uh, going to be significant economic impacts for Canadians, for workers, for businesses. To this point, the reassurances have been public, but the details largely kept private. We're going to be uh, talking very soon about measures that Canada is going to put forward to support people on the economic side. It turns out very soon is Wednesday. Government sources say the Prime Minister will announce significant steps in Canada's response to COVID-19. It will include a boost to research funding to combat the virus and government's intention to waive the one-week waiting period for EI benefits for people who can't work because of the virus. Canadians, workers uh, who need to self-isolate to protect themselves and to protect their neighbours. And while the provinces run the hospitals, Ottawa has the money and the financial means to respond. So sources say Trudeau's announcement will outline ways to bolster health workers and provincial health systems. 
whether it is uh, any anticipated shortages that they might have for equipment or personal protective gear or even in terms of human resources, uh, you know, additional supports that they might need in their hospitals or in their public health units. These are the kinds of conversations we're having. The Prime Minister will also give a detailed account of what has been done behind the scenes to slow the viral spread and limit the economic contagion. We're going to continue to act in ways uh, recommended by the top experts, by the top me medical professionals, coordinate with other uh, levels of government, coordinate with the international community, do everything we can to keep ensuring that Canadians are kept safe. Trudeau's announcement will deal with the immediate pressures caused by COVID-19. There will be additional measures in the upcoming budget and more after that once the full impact of the coronavirus is known. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Turning now to Italy, a country locked down, overwhelmed and increasingly desperate. More than 10,000 people are now infected, by far the most outside China. More than 600 people have died and the latest death toll is also the highest in one day so far at 168. And as Rene Filipponi explains, doctors are now being forced to make some very hard choices. Covered head to toe in protective gear, doctors work round the clock and compare the situation to a war zone. At some hospitals, emergency rooms and entire wards have been converted to intensive care units. Italian doctors have warnings for countries like Canada. Your health system, no matter how good, how efficient, how modern it is, sooner or later will collapse because the number of patients is too high for the resources we have. The situation is so bad, one specialist told local media they are overwhelmed and are having to choose who to treat. And in some cases, older patients may not get the same level of care. Underscoring the crisis for a country with the second oldest population in the world, a population most vulnerable to the virus. The entire country is under lockdown. No public gatherings, no sporting events, and no travel. At train stations, police are checking paperwork. Only those with authorized work or family reasons are allowed to travel. Yesterday, so she booked her ticket. CBC News more. met Canadian Kate Andrews in Milan last month but at the beginning of the outbreak. She is now under quarantine. We're not worried about running out of food. The neighbors are great. There's people that are there to help us, but it is a weird feeling being completely dependent on the kindness of your neighbors. In an attempt to control the spread, Italian grocery stores are only allowing a few people in at a time and keeping shoppers a safe distance apart. When I was paying, they made sure that there was the, the right distance between one person and another. All of this has grave economic consequences. In an effort to help Italians ride it out, the government is considering suspending taxes, mortgage payments and bills, and will vote on those measures this week. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. So here now is Dr. Taslim Ninji. You're an ER doctor from Humber River Hospital, fresh off your shift, so thank you for coming in. My pleasure. We look at Italy. It's a wealthy country, a top-tier medical system, and yet it's overwhelmed. So what does your ER look like now? So certainly we are seeing increased volumes. Uh, we're seeing a lot more pressure on the emergency department system, especially as people are coming in even just for screening if they've had travel history or contact. And so we're starting to look at creative ways we can offset some of that volume in our eMERGE and in our hospitals so that we can get to our sickest patients. So that's gonna look like things like screening centers that are offsite, not in the hospital. And you're gonna see, I think, an increasing number of those uh, across the city and across the provinces. And then we're also really talking about how do we get creative about creating capacity in a system that is already close to full capacity. So we have surge mechanisms, as we call them, to get to that overage. We see those in, in influenza times. And now we're looking at that. So how do we get creative about creating space and capacity within our system to see these patients and treat them? So that means maybe putting off uh, elective surgeries, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. So you know what, when we are talking about that, when we need to create space, we will do things like canceling elective procedures, elective surgeries. We can use virtual care mechanisms, offsite screening, things like that. 
So what does Canada's medical system do you think actually need to stock up on at the moment? Yeah, so when patients are coming into the hospital requiring hospitalization because of COVID-19, we're seeing a real spectrum in terms of what they need, right from something just like supplemental oxygenation, right up through an ICU bed and ventilation. So we're really having conversations at the hospital level to look at what capacity we have for ICU beds and for ventilators as an example. And then what we really need to do is look at sharing, right? And so um, we do normally transfer transport patients from hospital to hospital if we need to because one hospital is at capacity mm -hmm. when another isn't. How do we do that safely and how do we do that when there's pressure on all of us as cases may continue to increase in number? Oh, the logistics are intense. Dr. Nimji, thanks very much. My pleasure. Every day across North America we see more restrictions, more cancellations, more limitations on events and on travel as officials try to buy time. Ellen Morrow looks at some of the more sweeping measures so far. In this New York City suburb, some of the strongest containment measures yet in the U.S. Schools closed, large gatherings banned in New Rochelle, home to most of the cases in New York State. This is literally a matter of uh, life and death. That's not an overly rhetorical statement. Here's your grocery delivery. In New Brunswick today, one of the strongest measures in Canada. Any staff or students returning from international travel anywhere must stay home from school for two weeks. This is a, a directive coming from government. We expect people to comply with it because we live in a country that honors the rule of law. This expert says banning some large events may make sense, but officials need to strike the right balance. I think it can definitely stimulate a lot of fear in people that we're in a situation that might be worse than what we're actually experiencing right now. There's been a domino effect with more coronavirus closures and cancellations every day. Pearl Jam postponing its North American tour. The popular Coachella Music Festival delayed until at least October. Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy ditching their studio audiences and major U.S. universities like Princeton and Harvard switching to online classes. You have something this big uh, that, that's just causing chaos around campus around the world. It adds a lot of stress. That stress spreading along with the virus, but it's prudence, not panic, officials are urging. This is a real problem, but whether or not you should be fearful of, of it, you know, I, I, I don't find that a helpful response. While Canadians wonder what cancellations and closures may be coming next, officials are reminding everyone to wash your hands often and avoid touching your face. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. 228 Canadians stranded by a coronavirus outbreak aboard a cruise ship in California are now back in Canada. So they returned on a flight from Oakland and landed at the Canadian Forces Base in Trenton, Ontario, where they will be isolated for two weeks. That base has become a rough and ready quarantine facility now for stranded passengers of two cruises. And cruise ships have been singled out as especially at risk for spreading the virus. Ottawa has warned Canadians that if you are planning a cruise, skip it and stay on land. Jonathan Gatehouse explains why. Today is February 19. How dangerous was the coronavirus outbreak aboard the Diamond Princess in February? A new study modeling the onboard epidemic reaches some sobering conclusions. It started with a single passenger and quickly ballooned to a rate of infection four times that of Wuhan, China. Left unchecked, the study suggests the disease would have eventually touched 79% of those on board, some 2,900 people. However, researchers also say that if everyone had been evacuated from the vessel when the first cases were discovered, the outbreak could have been contained to just 2% or 76 people. More than 600 people did get sick and seven have died. The study concludes the key factor was the ship itself. A floating petri dish where people from all over the world spend weeks in tight quarters, putting their trust in the cleaning staff and everyone else's hand hygiene. I would probably not advise anybody to go on a cruise for the foreseeable future until the situation settles down. Yet the cruise industry says that it's safe, that they're uh, initiating a bunch of new safeguards to make sure that everyone on board is healthy. I mean. That's a mixed message. Who should people believe at this point? Given what we've already seen in the last few weeks, I think that it's a very difficult standard to meet. Some experts say the coronavirus crisis points to a need to reimagine the spaces where we work, play and travel, such as using materials that can better withstand vigorous cleaning. 
If I told you that your cruise ship was going to have a vinyl headboard, you might not think that sounds really luxurious, but I assure you there are properties that we can put into vinyl now that allow it to be both comfortable, luxurious, and safe. The cruise industry is trying to weather the storm, making it easier to cancel and rebook while slashing prices. The question is, what will win out with consumers? The lure of a bargain vacation or warnings from public health officials? Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a day after the biggest U.S. stock market plunge since 2008 and the worst drop in Canada in 30 years, today markets made a partial recovery. The Red Cross rang the closing bell on Wall Street, perhaps fitting for a market in medical distress. The S&P and Dow both ping-ponged before ending the day up nearly 5%. It was the same story on the TSX, but closer to 3%. Markets may have been responding to signals from the White House. It will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. We want to protect our shipping industry, our cruise uh, industry, cruise ships. Uh, we want to protect our airline industry, very important. Be calm, it's really working out, and a lot of good things are gonna happen. Donald Trump is reportedly mulling over a broad array of measures, including aid to airlines, support for paid sick leave, and a huge cut to payroll taxes. And as another major round of voting is underway in the race for the White House, coronavirus concerns are making themselves felt. Both Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden have canceled rallies scheduled for tonight in Cleveland, Ohio, but still proceeding votes in Washington, Idaho, North Dakota, Missouri, Mississippi, and Michigan. That last one, Michigan, is the big prize with 125 delegates at stake. So the outcome of that race has the power to determine the future of Bernie Sanders' run. Paul Hunter is in Monroe, Michigan tonight, just south of Detroit. Paul. Yeah, well, Joe Biden seems to be doing it. Who'd have thought that just a couple of weeks ago? Tonight, here in Michigan, he's won. It's a state rich in delegates and in symbolism. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Could it be in the Democrats' seemingly never-ending battle to find a challenger for Donald Trump that tonight they're finally honing in on it? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yes. In Monroe City, Michigan, those we met were clear. Yes, I voted uh, for Joe Biden. I voted for Joe Biden. Biden. Why? Uh, I feel he has the best chance to uh, beat uh, Trump. For so many, it's that simple. To get back to normalcy, it's painful for me to see what's going on in this country nowadays. Monroe, a factory town southeast of Detroit, is itself in the spotlight, not least for its symbolism. This county twice backed Barack Obama for the White House. In 2016, it flipped and voted Trump. Monroe also favored Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton, as did all of Michigan. But all of a sudden, the landscapes changed. I think we got to get Trump out and get a Democrat in. And uh, I think Biden has the best chance of doing it. So all eyes are now on these voters. Biden's been surging. It's as if voters now know who it's going to be. Joe Mentum, they call it. Sanders, who needs Michigan to reignite his campaign, this week slammed Biden for being part of the so-called establishment. Does anybody really think that that is going to be the campaign of excitement and energy that's going to grow the base that we need to defeat Trump? I don't think so. I say that honestly as a friend of Joe's. You're for shit. As for Biden, he got cornered today when a factory worker accused him of plans to get too tough on hardening gun laws. I did not say that. That's did. not true. I did not it's a viral say that. Video. Still, it's not the kind of thing likely to put off voters dead set on getting rid of Trump. Even those who today voted Sanders underlined they'll back Biden if Biden takes on Trump. I would vote for a celery stick if it could defeat Donald Trump. <laughs> You know, she jokes, Adrian, but that's underlining how Democrats see this election. This isn't like other elections. This is about one thing and one thing only, the way they see it, and it's getting Donald Trump out of office. Tonight in Michigan, the key state of Michigan, Democrats have said their guy to do that is Joe Biden. All right, Paul Hunter in Monroe, Michigan. Thanks, Paul. Well, today marks one year since the Ethiopian Airlines disaster. And there's not a day that we don't think of her. 
Up next, we return to the crash site and hear from the families of the Canadian victims. Plus, a spot in Canada's Music Hall of Fame. This is absolutely the biggest one. Why Jan Arden isn't showing any signs of slowing down. And later, the end of the handshake. We've kind of been doing like a little elbow bump. How coronavirus fears are inspiring alternate greetings. We're back in two. One year ago today, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 took off from Addis Ababa Airport. But just minutes into the flight, the Boeing 737 MAX 8 plunged to the ground. Everyone on board was killed, including 18 Canadians. Well, today, families and friends returned to the scene. Susan Ormiston spoke with some of them. Too young to know why all this snaking through their farmland, the cars and buses just kept coming with the anxious faces of family and friends who made it back to Ethiopia a year since their worst day ever. It is painful, but as painful as it is, the love for my wife and my children and my mom-in-law uh, doesn't leave. Paul and Jirogi lost all of them. I want to commemorate their, their lives. I want to remember them. And I want to see that place where um, uh, their flesh was left. The crash last March left a deep crater and an open wound. The site now is gentler. Fenced off temporarily, the crater filled in. <laughs> Today's memorial was private. Media kept far away, but families took their own video as villagers watched from a hillside. My family was shattered. Canadian Joan Vincent, who lost her daughter Angela, spoke and then shared with us. We think constantly about the possibilities of what their life would have been. About softening grief. It doesn't hurt as much. So even on the times that we, we say their name now, we don't maybe fall apart. And yet. And there's not a day that we don't think of her. 18 Canadians died on this ground of the 157 from across the world. Families consider this place sacred ground. The only things they have left of their loved ones, a piece of clothing, a passport, came in boxes to their homes as late as October. The government has buried small coffins here with remains that were too tiny to be identified. So this is a special place. Clarice Moore struggled with her grief this week, stuck on the date her daughter died. It doesn't give me any comfort or anything, but I just want to see it again. Um, the place where I know part of Daniel still here. As they return to their homes across the world, they still want to know who will be held responsible for this doomed flight and how will this never happen again. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Garabukan, Ethiopia. Now, among the Canadians who died in the crash, 24-year-old Danielle Moore. Today, her father marked the anniversary by protesting outside Transport Canada. So it's in memory of my daughter that uh, I'm doing this. Uh, she was a fighter, and, and she, uh, she stood for justice. And there's been a travesty here. Chris Moore says the biggest question he still has is why Transport Canada didn't ground the Boeing 737 MAX 8 four months earlier when there was another crash. That one was also blamed on Boeing's flawed anti-stall system. A House committee is holding public hearings into the MAX 8, but Moore says that doesn't go far enough. He wants a full-blown inquiry. Here are some of the other stories we're watching across Canada tonight. A six-year-old girl was seriously injured after a suspicious fall from a balcony at this Toronto apartment building. Police say they received a call this afternoon and arrived to find the child in medical distress outside the building. She was taken to hospital in serious but stable condition. It's still unclear how she fell or from what floor. At Quebec. What happened in Quebec on January 22nd is an absolute tragedy. Top parole and corrections officials expressed condolences for the death of 22-year-old Marilyn Levesque, a sex worker killed in January by a convicted murderer out on day parole. During two hours of questioning on Parliament Hill today, officials vowed to take steps to prevent another incident like this from happening again. The parole officers involved in the case have been suspended from supervising offenders. 
This is not about the last six years. This is about the next 50 years of this province. It was important for us to actually make sure that we leave no stone unturned. Premier Dwight Ball says police will be investigating Newfoundland and Labrador's troubled Muskrat Falls hydroelectric project. This comes more than two years after a public inquiry started investigating cost overruns of the $12.7 billion dam. A scathing final report accuses the former progressive conservative government of failing to protect the best interests of the province. The project is two years behind schedule and about double its original cost. Well, still ahead, understanding your sick leave policies. If your boss tells you to stay home, will you get paid? But first. It became my therapist and my friend and my solitude and my comfort. My conversation with Jan Arden about her place in Canadian music and what moves her now. Welcome back. After nearly three decades of heart-wrenching hits, Jan Arden is cementing her place in the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. She will be inducted Sunday night at the Juno Awards in Saskatoon. So you might associate that sort of honour with someone at the end of an illustrious career. But with Jan Arden, you sort of get the feeling she's just charging faster and further ahead all the time. We caught up at her home just outside Calgary. I'm not pretty, but I'm smart and I'm bold and I'm brave. Long known for delivering devastatingly real songs, Jan Arden is quickly becoming the hardest working woman in show business. Three, two, one, action. She's the star of her own sitcom, Jan, but Arden isn't just diving into an acting career. This is a very stressful situation! I think that's Jan Arden. She also has a weekly podcast, a new book, a new album, and an upcoming cross-country tour. The headliner, though, the Sunday's Junos and a ticket into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. The incomparable Jan Arden. It's a big moment in a life of them, but something, or rather someone, will be missing that night. Jan's best friend, her mom, who died of Alzheimer's just over a year ago. The grief still grips, maybe always will, and yet, <laughs> the humor and humility that make Jan Arden such a Canadian treasure still shine. Look at the geese, you guys. They're fine. It's so late to be going south, you knuckleheads. She's got a lot to say, so we caught up at her home just outside Calgary. Welcome to Jan's Road. Thank you. Funny meeting you here. Yeah. This, uh, is this your happy place when people talk about, you know, I need to go to my happy place? I love getting out here and walking. It's, it is usually quiet. You know, we've found underpants along here. What? I think I think this was at one time a little bit of a lover's lane. You know, old country roads. Right. So in since your mom has been gone, so it's been about a year. Yeah, it's... she died December 19th, December 29th, 2019. How? 2018. Oh, 2018. Yeah, okay. How have you been managing? You know, I think I'm doing pretty good for the most part. I mean, I would do anything to have a weekend to hang out and, you know, have some food yeah. and eat some potato chips. And But, uh, no, they were ready to go. And my mom, she left me with a sense of positivity. It wasn't a bad thing. So that's who I had as my, my guiding light. They led you well. Yeah, they both did. They'd be so proud of you now, this Hall of Fame thing, I think. Of all the awards you've gotten, and I, I don't know if I'm oh, just projecting, is, but don't the, you think this, this one This is the biggest one. This is, this is absolutely the biggest one. You know, I have to say I was mind boggled with the Order of Canada, but I love the sentiment of the Order of Canada because it's about doing positive things for your country. And yep. I am a very proud Canadian. Okay, so as much as I love the outdoors. Can what do you mean? In, can we go inside? What do you mean? That northern wind's kind of getting to you? <laughs> Just a little you bit. You Ontario girls? No. I know. Let's go light a fire. Okay, thank you. Let's oh. go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's deeper than you think. It's a little bit. Where's our snowshoes? <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you for, I mean, thank you for letting us. <laughs> Yeah. Just, it's it's about minus 12, minus 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually can't feel some of my parts, but we're, I'm okay with ah. that. 
Um, for you, was it always going to be music that sort of set you free and set you on your path? Was that destined to be? I don't know. I mean, I think I went into music because my dad was an alcoholic. Hmm. And it seems like a weird thing, but he was such a big drinker that in order for me to stay out of his way, I went into the basement. Record player was down there. Uh, all the records were down there. My mom's little old guitar sitting in the corner that she tried to learn to play. And I, it became my therapist and my friend and my solitude and my comfort. It, I didn't recognize it at that time. I was mm -hmm. 10 or 11 years old. But now that I get a chance to look back, it's very clear of how music, it transported me away from a very tumultuous family dynamic. Were you scared of him? Yeah, I was scared of my dad. We all were, you could ask any of my brothers. He was a fierce force to be reckoned with. But I'm kinder about it as I've, you know, he's been gone four years now, four and a half years. And alcoholism is a disease. Um, and I'm able to look at that now through my own eyes, because I've had drinking problems myself my whole adult life. Mm. But yeah, scary, scary guy. How do you think, after seeing that as a child, alcohol seeped into your life? God, I didn't want it to. Yeah. I didn't want to be like that. I'm not like my dad so much as, um, like I'm not a mean-spirited person. Did you like drinking? I loved drinking. The fallout was terrifying. I loved it and hate it. Ask anybody who's been a binger in their lives. But you're completely sober now. Sober, sober. My mother's uh, Alzheimer's helped me too because I couldn't be hungover and, and look after her. And I just knew, I thought, why am I doing this? Do you, you know what's hard sometimes to, to reconcile is that there, I, I feel like there are a couple Jans. So there's the Jan when I listen to your music. And I, you know, I remember being in university and listening to your music and it was the sound. What were you thinking? <laughs> it was the soundtrack to so many hard <laughs> things that were going on in life, right? Like it reminded you of some really tough stuff. And that doesn't seem to. To fit. It doesn't cross over with, with the sense of who you are. I mean, you're open and you're funny and, and you're positive and... You know, like part of, part of that is, and it makes sense to me now, was it was, it was a form of therapy for me. I was always a funny kid. So I think when the stuff was happening with my family, my, my older brother was in trouble. He went down a different road than me and I just, I had found music. So I didn't want to be funny in the music, but it was good for me to write down things that bothered me. I did it without even knowing what mm -hmm. I was doing. I was secretly writing all these songs, but it was almost like Dear Diary. Yeah. For me, it just had chords to it. But there's an intersection, as I understand it, in your life where things are just getting great with your music, and then they got really hard with your brother. Yeah. In the same month. Yeah, my brother was arrested for a first-degree murder in the same month that I was signed to a record deal. So I often think about how my parents navigated that. What happened with him? He, you know, it was a litany of things. He was sexually abused when he was a young teenager. We didn't find that out until five or six years ago mm. that he even spoke about it. So my dad's, you know, a force of whatever he's doing, and he picked on Dre all the time. Dre just drank, and he said he, he would do any drug that he could find anything. It started with, you know, DUIs and drug charges and assaults and choking with intent and I mean I could go on and on and on. And I, I need to, you know, preface all of this by saying he's always, you know, maintained his innocence with this murder charge. And uh, the innocence uh, program at the University of British Columbia vets thousands of cases every year and they took him on a decade ago mm. and are absolutely adamant and steadfast in telling our whole family that there's impossible that he committed this crime. And I, he's been there 27 years. When my mom was in the throes of her disease, I told her that he was out. Is he? I said, yeah, he's in his apartment. He's using all your doilies. He is. Well, he was such a homemaker. And I was so glad that I lied to her hmm. about that. How are you doing without her? I really miss my mom. But I, she just informs my every decision. Hmm. She was such a champion of mine, like she just cheered me on my whole life. And I wish she could have hung around like a little bit longer, but been sane. But I lost my mom 
my mom like 10 years mm. ago. Anyone that's gone through this realizes it's such a hard thing when they don't remember your childhood and they can't answer all your questions yeah. and they can't save you. Our parents are always supposed to save us. And sometimes they, we gotta save them. Your new book called If I Knew Then. Yeah. If you knew what? If I knew all of this, if I knew, if I could have told myself at 25 or 30 years old, listen, you got so much stuff to wade through, but you're gonna come out of it the other side. And who or what will be in your head in that moment at the Junos when you're inducted into the Hall of Fame? Every single person that I ever met in my life that helped me or didn't help me and how valuable they both were. Sometimes it's all the people that aren't cheering you on that make you even more boundless. Well, that's what you are. Thank our you. hands are frozen. God. There is They're no human warmth in our hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Cold but uh, warm <laughs> exactly. at the same time. Uh, after the break, paid versus unpaid sick leaves. What you should know about your workplace policies during this coronavirus outbreak. We'll be right back. With so much we don't know about the new coronavirus and the outbreak changing daily, this message remains constant. Stay home from work if you're sick or were exposed. But as Cameron McIntosh tells us, many Canadians can't afford that. I made a lot during the quarantine. At least Gary Liu had time to perfect his cooking. He's symptom-free after 14 days of self-isolation. Try something? Upon returning from vacation in China. I have to be responsible for the community. So that's why I stay home to do the quarantine. He works in a federal lab. Turns out the isolation was unpaid. And I was asking him, can we take the um, sick leave? I said, no. He's not the only one who's faced the question, will your employer pay you? Turns out, they don't have to. In federally regulated industries, employees are legally entitled up to three paid sick days. Among the provinces, only Quebec legislates paid sick days at two. For just about everyone else, it comes down to agreements between employees and employers. Winnipeg-based Palliser Furniture has deep ties to Italy and China. All non-essential travel is cancelled. As for workers travelling on personal time, they've been warned if they quarantine, they may not be paid. Right now we have no other choice. We have to try to be as cautious as we possibly can, as careful as we possibly can. While some people can work from home, many cannot, like the service industry. Fair work advocates in Ontario are pushing for seven paid COVID sick days. Oh, yeah. People have to make a decision as to whether or not they're going to pay their rent, put food on the table, take care of their kids, or stay home and not be paid. The federal labour minister says it will be easier for quarantined and isolated workers to qualify for EI. We have, as you know as a government, reduced the wait periods from two weeks to one week. While it cost him in the end, Liu says he's still glad he did it. If I spread out the, the virus, that would be uh, very bad. Now, for anyone planning to travel, advice remains to watch for government advisories. Employers will likely use those to determine what kind of sick leave to grant. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. After the break, searching for an alternative to single-use plastics. Why compostable doesn't always mean green. That's next. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, Jason Kenney endorses federal conservative leadership candidate Aaron O'Toole. We look at why Alberta's premier is taking sides and what it means for the party. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. A federal ban on single-use plastics is coming, and many businesses and consumers are already looking for alternatives. But... As Tashana Reed explains, plant-based compostable plastics are not necessarily the greener choice. They can be made out of corn or sugarcane, cups, cutlery and takeout containers designed to be tossed in the compost bin instead of the garbage. Here at this restaurant trade show in Toronto, compostable plastic suppliers are at every turn. It's all natural, right? It's plant-based, it's going to go from the earth back to the earth. 
Certified compostable means the product has been lab tested and is proven to break down within three months in a commercial composting facility. But certification is voluntary in Canada, and that means some products labeled compostable might not be. There's two things I think we need to work on. First is getting stuff certified, and second is making sure that for all compostables, uh, there are places where these can be composted. While some institutions and commercial buildings have contracts with commercial composters, most municipal curbside programs in Canada don't accept compostable plastics in green bins. And they get sent to the landfill, where conditions aren't typically suitable for compostable plastics. This Ontario composting company is one of the few we found in Canada that processes compostable plastics. A lot of these windows right now are, are pushing anywhere from 75 to 78 uh, degrees Celsius. The company was asked to test compostable products for the National Art Centre. It took one year of testing to find a product that met their standards. Okay, so what do we see after one week? So after one week, you can see inside of here, we've also got some traditional paper plates and things like that in here as well. But here's what that green, green cutlery looks like. It's very fragile, very breakable. One of these other sets of forks that are in here, no, they're knives. There's, there's the knife, it's not breaking down at all, but that's marketed as a biodegradable product. Right. Uh, as we move forward then a, a following week, you can see the green is breaking down very well again. It's further, just a crumble. Crumbles apart in your hand at this point. Oh, wow. That green cutlery is one of the products the National Arts Centre chose for their facility. Only three weeks into their eight-week compost cycle, it's significantly broken down compared to the other compostable branded plastics. Finding the right compostable product and getting it to a facility that will process it are still big hurdles in Canada's complex waste management system. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Kingston, Ontario. And here are some of the other stories making headlines tonight. Thousands of protesters were met with tear gas today in Venezuela as demonstrators rallied in what is expected to be the beginning of a series of escalating protests against the government of President Nicolas Maduro. Opposition leader Juan Guaido joined the march and led an impromptu session of the National Assembly. Maduro supporters held their own separate rallies in downtown Caracas. Russian President Vladimir Putin put forward political plans that would allow him to remain in power until 2036. He opened the door to constitutional changes that could let him rule until the age of 83, if he so desires. Otherwise, he'd need to step down in 2024, when his second consecutive term ends. Kremlin critics call this move a constitutional coup. Well, the second person ever to be cured of HIV has decided to go public with his identity. 40-year-old Adam Castillejo, also known as the London Patient, has been free of the virus for more than two years now after stopping treatment. He says he wants to be an ambassador of hope to the millions of people living with HIV. Castillejo received a bone marrow transplant from an HIV-resistant donor. When we come back, putting the handshake on hope. Hey, Mayor Mike. How are you? Oh. <laughs> from politicians to everyday Canadians. That's next in tonight's moment. Well, because of the coronavirus outbreak, health officials have been suggesting that folks skip the handshake for a while. And while not everybody's on board, there are lots of people from politicians to everyday Canadians willing to get creative. So we wanted to ask a few Canadians what they've come up with, and that is our moment. People are doing this in the air or they're doing the elbow thing or they're doing like, oh, hey, but not really shaking hands because, I mean, we have to be careful, right? In my office, we've kind of been doing like a little elbow bump. It's an old habit. You reach out your hand when you're greeting somebody and, you know, if you see that they've gone rock and you're still with the old paper, I mean, you just take it for what it is. <laughs> so we are doing namaste <laughs> rather than handshaking. I have meetings all the time. So, yeah, shake hands. Don't, don't honestly think twice about it. Oh, oh, sorry, come back in here. Sorry, sorry. Oh, oh, over, over, over. A lot of my friends and family are telling me not to. It's just like I work in a business environment, and that's kind of part of part of the day-to-day. -day. For the most part, people I know, I've been hugging them. 
<laughs> so it's like I don't even know. But uh, I find some people also say ask before you approach. I see everybody hitting Purell left, right and center. And once I see that, then I'm more than willing to give them a handshake. With British courtesy, would definitely shake your hand. <laughs> <laughs> See, so, so let me just say this. I, I understand all of the reasons why we ought not to be shaking hands yes. or at least scale back a little bit. I'm kind of with the last guy, though. I, 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 I still shake hands all the time, but I just think I'd, I'd wash them after. That's, oh, that's maybe the best. Well, so here's a little tip, because it's all about not touching your face, ultimately. Right. right. Yeah, so yeah, um, we learned from doctors a while ago that if you really want to know how many times you touch your face, try for 10 minutes not putting your hands above your shoulders. I promise you, it is incredibly hard. I believe you. <laughs> that is a national for March the 10th. Good night. Good night.